The SHRs and your family and friends that's joining us the first time tonight on SHR at Home, the webinar. Goeienavond aan al ons ere veldwachters, jylle familie en vriende, wat vanavond vir die eerste keer SHR at Home kyk. Thank you, Peter, for the introduction and hosting this event. And tonight we are privileged to have Willie Engelbrecht from Sandpark HRs. Welcome to you, Willie. Wish I was there with you tonight. Here is some background on him. Willie grew up in Bushman land, Bushman land, right on the door of the Kalahari. He studied business economics at the University of Free State and completed his postgraduate studies at the University of Stellenbosch. Following his studies, he completed a 35-year corporate career as a senior executive. Willie was fortunate to grow up in a national park and has always been and had a keen interest in the environment. He joined the Sand Parks Honorary Rangers 25 years ago and apart from serving as the organization's executive committee, he is also responsible for training honorary rangers, sand park rangers in the field of ecology, animal behavior, and guiding. Willie himself is a registered field guide and is regarded as an expert in our arid national parks and specifically the ecology of the Kalahari. During the presentation, you are welcome to post your questions on the Q&A tab or on Facebook and those will be answered at the end of the presentation. Willie, we are eagerly awaiting to hear your presentation on lion behavior tonight. And with that, I'm handing over to you. Thank you, Francois, uh, for the introduction. Uh, good evening, uh, Sand Parks on Air Rangers and, uh, and friends joining us on, on Facebook. Um, as you can see, I'm sitting, if you don't know where I'm sitting, I'm sitting uh, next to the fire at the Lofi's Dry Bush Camp. Uh, for those of you that don't know where it is, it's right in the middle of the Kalari Gemsbok National Park. And it is by far my most favorite place in the world. I would easily live here for the rest of my life. Be that as it may, I've, as you can see, I've kept seats open for you. And I would like you to join me for a talk on the behavioral ecology of lions uh, of the Galahari. Uh, in addition to Francois's introduction, <coughs> excuse me, in addition to uh, Francois's introduction, I would like to add that I view myself as an amateur ecologist with a very keen interest in nature and the way in which organisms interact with the environment. Uh, you know, there is a fine line between ecologist and observer uh, and, and make your own observations uh, as far as this is concerned. And I, uh, I certainly fall in between those two. I was fortunate to grow up on the fringes of the Kalahari and over years spent many hours observing, discovering and learning from others about, uh, about the Kalahari and its inhabitants. And tonight it is my privilege to share some of this, uh, some of this with you. I, I would just like to uh, say that the bandwidth here at, uh, at Lofi's Dry, we had people specially flown in to, uh, to enable me to speak to you tonight is not very, very great. So, uh, I will later stop my uh, stop my video sharing, and then uh, you will only hear my voice. But I will share some interesting slides with you, and then I cannot um, start without thanking Francois for his introduction and for the SHRs to choose Francois to, to introduce me because you know at the Indawa last year Jimmy introduced me, and he got the name of my, the school where I matriculated in Kakamas, and I know there uh, are a lot of my school friends listening tonight. Uh, he totally mispronounced it, so I'm actually very glad that uh, we've got a Burki tonight to introduce me and not a Soti uh, saying Kakamas and not Kakamas. So be that as it may, uh, it's my privilege tonight to, uh, to share some of the, the, the Kalahari secrets with you. I just want to get my, my slides going, so if you will allow me. So, um, 
The subject of my talk this evening uh, goes about the behavioral ecology of the lions of the Kalahari. Uh, this subject is so diverse and interesting that it will keep me talking for hours. Uh, I've learned so much uh, about them. Um, I've learned so much about them uh, uh, over the over the years, um, and uh, and tonight I only have 50 minutes to share it with you. So I'll do my utmost to share in this limited time some of the most interesting facts about these uh, wonderful creatures with you. Uh, let me start off by answering a question I'm often faced with. And that is if the lions of the Kalahari are of the same subspecies as lions found elsewhere in Africa. And the answer is, uh, is quite frankly, uh, to be found in, in my next slide. Um, so as you can see, lions of the Kalahari will never run from their prey. They will never hide from their prey and they will never climb trees to get away from their prey. Uh, I'm not sure this uh, almost looks like uh, Kruger lions to me, uh, but be that as it may, um, uh, these are definitely not, uh, not Kalahari lions. Jokes aside, before I give a definite answer, let's, uh, let's just quickly start to look, uh, look at the taxonomy of, uh, of lions. Lions belong to the order carnivora, and they are carnivores, which they are meat eaters, and all meat eaters belong uh, belongs to this uh, to this um, this order. Uh, their family name is Philidae, and all cats, even your house cat, belongs to the family um, to the family Philidae. <clears throat> when it comes to uh, the genus. Um, this is where the differentiation between lions and other cats come in. Lions belong to the genus Panthera. And, uh, and Panthera, uh, the cats that belong to this genus are all the large roaring lions, leopards, tigers, um, jaguars, and snow leopards belong to this, uh, to this um, genus. Uh, finally, all lions belong to the species Leo. So, irrespective of where the lion occurs, the, the species is Leo. And there are five living subspecies of lion in the world. And uh, if you look at the next slide, which uh, shows you the, the distribution of these uh, five species, we will clearly see that the uh, lions in Kruger and lions in the Kalahari all belong to the subspecies Krugeri. And, um, and uh, so to answer your question, does they belong to the same subspecies or species? They belong to the same species and the same subspecies as all other lions in, in South Africa. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with uh, or familiar with the uh, lion distribution in South Africa, most of the lions that we find in our South African national parks, the ones down in Edo, uh, the ones in, um, in Marakele, the ones in Karoo National Park, the ones, uh, uh, yes, those, those areas, most of those lions, the core of those lion prides, either originated from uh, the Kalari Gemsbok National Park or Kruger National Park. So they are all related, the all South African lions are related to each other. There are, however, a few uh, physical and behavioral differences between lions of the Kalahari and those of the rest uh, of South Africa. And it's very interesting to note um, these behavioral differences between them. Uh, the driver, of course, of these differences uh, is by far the differentiation in habitat in which these lions occur. One must remember that on the one side, you sit with uh, lions in, 
in a vast arid semi-desert of which 90% is covered in sand and there is very little vegetation. Uh, the temperatures in this uh, semi-desert varies from uh, minus 10 degrees in winter and uh, mid 40s in summer. On the other hand, you, on the other side, you have lions uh, living in the savannas and uh, savannas that are largely covered in gooseveld trees and grass and with temperature rain, temperatures ranging from 8 degrees Celsius in, uh, in winter and mid 30s in summer. So as you can see, there's a huge difference between the elements in these two habitats. So Kalahari lions went through some physical changes in order to survive in this, uh, in this dry land in which they occur. And I would like to take you through some of the main physical differences between Kalahari lions and the lions uh, of Kruger or even Addo or, or elsewhere. The first uh, physical difference is that Kalahari lions weigh slightly less than lions uh, of Kruger and lions in, in uh, Karua and, um, and Addo. <clears throat> The reason, the reason for that is not, they're not really smaller than the lions in, um, in Kruger. They are just, um, uh, they merely uh, in better shape than the ones in Kruger. They have to walk further in search of prey and they work harder to kill their prey than their counterparts, uh, than their counterparts in Kruger. So we can basically say they are much fitter and because of that, they, um, they, of course, weigh less than the ones in Kruger National Park. Another physical difference between the two is the Kalahari lions are slightly longer legged than the ones in Kruger National Park. We must remember that uh, these Kalahari lions need to hunt in, in tall grass areas. <clears throat> these dunes are covered in, in grass during the rainy season, and because of that, they have evolved uh, slightly longer legs in order to be effective hunters in, uh, in this grassland in, um, in the Kalahari. Um, the third difference between them is they do have bigger paws than the ones in Kruger. Now, those of you that have been to the Kalahari and that have driven to Lofi's Dry will know that you need bigger tires and, uh, and wider tires to stay above the sand. And this is basically the only reason why they have bigger paws. It enables them to be more efficient hunters in loose sand and to stay above, uh, above the sand. Also, one must remember that lions don't, uh, they don't sweat like humans. Uh, the only way in which they perspire is through their paws and through um, through uh, sweat pores situated between their toes. So bigger pores obviously help them to, uh, to perspire more effectively than, than the lines in the Kalahari. And that is why whenever you drive through the Kalahari, you will often see um, these lines, if they sleep, they, they sleep on their backs with their pores exposed uh, exposed upwards and uh, and of course they can uh, they can sweat more effectively or perspire more effectively that way. There are also some additional physical features that may be of interest to you. Um, one being uh, the fact that um, uh, and it's it's not necessarily a comparison between the between lions of the Kalari and lions of Kruger, but these are now the Kalari lions. The males are obviously much bigger than the females. The average weight of a Kalahari lion male is about 190 kilograms. So those of you that think you can take a, a male on, <clears throat> I, th I will think twice. Uh, I mean, it, apart from the fact that it's much stronger than you, it weighs about twice your, your uh, weight. And then the females weigh an average of, uh, weigh in it an average of uh, 130 130 kilograms. Also, the height is uh, slightly different. As you can see in the, in the slide, actually, the males are about 1.2 meters tall and the females 
are uh, one meter, one meter tall. Another uh, physical differentiation between the two are the fact that lions of the Kalahari live slightly longer than lions elsewhere. In the Kalahari, males and females can live up to uh, 16 years of age, which is extremely long if you, if you take that in Kruger and elsewhere in Africa, lions only reach an uh, age of uh, about 13 to 14 years. So um, a three-year difference is quite significant if your lifespan is only 16 years, uh, only 16 years old, especially if you take that lions normally only, uh, the males especially, they only start breeding at five years of age. So, uh, <clears throat> so Kalahari lions have got the ability to breed for uh, 11 years, where your Kruger lions only have ability to breed for eight years. So it's quite a, quite a difference between the two. Um, another frequently asked question is whether Kalahari lions are capable of climbing trees like their famous tree climbing cousins in the Serengeti. Uh, recent observations of lions in um, climbing trees were also made in, in Kruger, the Greater Kruger National Park, of course. Um, and, uh, but in the Serengeti, uh, they actually rest in, uh, in those trees. So the answer is, is simple. The nails of all lions can be protruded and therefore all lions are capable of climbing trees. In this slide, you can actually see um, that uh, the nails of this lion easily enables it to, uh, to climb trees. But um, uh, although they have the ability to climb trees, here is where we observe the first behavioral difference between lions of the Kalari and the rest of, uh, of the climbing lions. Uh, lions in the Serengeti are often seen lying high up on the branches of, uh, of those thorn and sausage trees uh, up in Tanzania. Uh, they do that to get away from uh, the reflective heat of the soil. Uh, it's much cooler up in the up in the trees, of course, and they also uh, to get away from pestering parasites living in the soil underneath uh, underneath these trees. Um, lion in the Kalahari, uh, on the other hand, are opportunistic tree climbers. They will only venture into trees if chased by a vehicle or when they want to get to prey stashed in trees uh, by leopards. You will never see them sleeping in trees. I, I remember in the, uh, I had the opportunity to, uh, to accompany Prof. Fritz Ilof uh, on some of his uh, research excursions. And I also um, with uh, Elias Larish and them present. And they were, of course, chasing these lions because they, they wanted to dart them and to, um, and to measure them. And if you chase them hard enough, uh, they will climb into a, into a tree to get away from, uh, from you. But apart from that, uh, this is a beautiful photograph uh, of Roxanne. Um, Roxanne uh, uh, of, uh, of a, a lioness climbing into a um, gray camel thorn tree to get to a prey stashed, uh, uh, looks like a springbok stashed in the tree by, uh, by leopards. So um, lions are of course nocturnal animals, which means they are mainly active at night. They have extremely good night vision. Uh, you know they can they can absolutely uh, they can actually absorb up to eight times more light in the dark than the average human eye can. Uh, this picture was taken at Lofi's Dry. It's a young male about uh, between four and five years old. Uh, he was one of a coalition group, and uh, of course we were sitting in the cage at Lofi's Dry looking at this guy on the outside. This is the only place, by the way, where 
humans are inside the cage and the lions roam freely outside the cage. And, um, and of course, this guy could see our every move inside the cage. Um, and we needed um, spotlights and flashlights to, to take uh, pictures, pictures of them. So I, I have mentioned um, that the unique habitat found in the Kalahari um, have got an influence on, on, the, on, on these lions. So if you look at the ecological behavior of lions, the habitat determines the social structure of organisms in, in, in general, not only in the Kalahari. And the social structure greatly influences their behavior. So although Kalahari lions share the same family tree with other lions in South Africa, their unique habitat contributes to significant differences in social structures uh, and behavior. Kalahari lions have three social structures of which prides are the most complicated of the three. Prides consist of an average of between one and five interrelated adult females, mostly one dominant adult male. Uh, it is very seldom that you will find two males in, in the same pride, and you will only find that well, when I say dominant males or breeding males, let me rather put it that way. Uh, and you will only find that way in large, uh, large prides, uh, prides of uh, more than more than 10, 12 adult females in them. And you do get prides that are that big in the, in the Kalahari. The average pride size in the Kalahari, by the way, is, uh, is five adult individuals. And, um, and that is basically uh, the one social structure. The next social group that you get in the Kalahari are that of uh, coalition groups consisting of either two or three young males between the ages of three and five years old. Uh, the reason why I say three to five years is uh, male lions can start breeding at the age of three years. So they will get kicked out of the pride at, uh, when they turn three in order not to, you know, because the dominant male obviously uh, view them as a threat and he will kick them out and they will wander and they will either, they will either be brothers or, or cousins from the same pride or they will link up with, uh, with another loner to form these uh, coalition, these coalition um, groups. They will remain nomadic until uh, the age of about five years old where they will try to take over a pride. The final social grouping are those of, um, of single nomads. Uh, single nomads are, um, uh, it can either be older males that were kicked out by a pride. It can also be young males looking for a coalition partner or females that left the pride wanting to form her own pride. These single nomads uh, do not stay single for long as it's very difficult to survive in the Kalahari on your own. Uh, you know, this harsh habitat, uh, it's, it's difficult to hunt on your own. It's difficult to, um, to survive on your own. Uh, and we will later come to it where hyenas are internal enemies of, of lions in the Kalahari as well, spotted by hyenas. And if they are on their own, they can easily be uh, conquered by a pack of uh, by a pack of hyenas. So let's uh, let's quickly look at the at the pride dynamics uh, of the Kalahari lion. In the Kalahari Gemswalk National Park, there are about two hundred and fifty um, lion uh, lions. Uh, that two hundred and fifty lions is divided in ten known prides. So we know of ten prides in the Kalari. There may be slightly more, but you know, um, through, uh, through rangers and research, uh, 10 known prides were identified. And of course, the rest is made up of other social groups, the coalitions and the, the single nomads. 
in the Kruger, uh, the, Kala, the Galagari Transfrontier Park uh, is home to about uh, 418 lions um, in the Greater Transfrontier Park. Uh, river prides in the, in the Gemswok Park, the river prides are slightly bigger than the dune prides and, uh, and mainly because uh, food are readily, more readily available in the, in the, in the rivers. We must keep in mind that 90% of the Gemsbok Park is covered uh, in dunes and only 10% is covered in the rivers and pans. So um, the river prides, uh, like I said, are slightly bigger. Uh, in a dry season, the pride can break up into much smaller groups. They can even break up totally into in, uh, nomad uh, individuals in order to survive. As a matter of fact, uh, in the Kalahari, uh, all the members in the Pride are very seldom together. They, uh, they, they are very, they, it's, it's in extreme circumstances where, where all the Pride members will be together at any one stage. Uh, females in a Pride, females form the permanent core of a Pride. So Prides are are formed by females. Uh, they stay in a pride and they may stay on in a pride depending on the availability of food. As long as food, are, uh, food is available, uh, they, they will stay into, in, in that pride. There's no hierarchy amongst females in a pride. They enjoy equal status. They are all the same. There are no dominant, uh, dominant females in Kalari prides. Uh, young females may leave the pride when they become sexually mature, and that's normally at about uh, between three and four years of age. And they may opt to, uh, to form their own prides, and they may then uh, they may leave, uh, leave a pride. The coalition males, on the other hand, they get kicked out of the pride, as I previously said, when they become sexually active. And that is uh, when they turn about three years, three years old. Uh, they will then form these coalitions to survive. It's almost a, a matter of strength in numbers. You can have a look at, uh, at these two young coalition partners. They are about five years old and they are now ready to take over a pride. And, um, and they, uh, they, the one on the, on the, on the far side, on the left hand side is already you can see he's lifting his tail indicating that he wants to mark start marking territory and um, and hence the reason why they uh, why he's, uh, he's lifting his tail these coalition males of course uh, they will also enjoy equal status in the in the the coalition they will show very little aggression to, uh, towards each other. They will often, you will often see them playing together, rubbing each other, and uh, they rub each other almost in a caressing way. They are big buddies and big friends, uh, and they will stay, they will live this nomadic life until they become sexually mature, which is about uh, five years old. So these two that we see on the slide, is uh, definitely between four and five years uh, of age. They will then try to get access to a pride either by challenging the existing dominant male or um, uh, or where the dominant male was kicked out by the females. Once they've succeeded, this is where the brotherly friendship ends. They will start contending for dominance in a pride, and this means trouble. Uh, you know, only one one will uh, will want to become the dominant uh, the dominant male, and then the fights uh, the fights between them uh, will start. There can only be one winner, and the loser will either leave the pride or submit to the dominance of uh, of his partner. Fighting, uh, as you can see in this slide. Uh, you know, there's only one way in which uh, a male can take over a pride. Uh, it's either when the females have kicked the male out after, after three years, or where 
a dominant male gets challenged by another male, either a young male or another male that was kicked out by a pride as well. Um, these fights can be extremely violent, as you can see, and it can lead to the death uh, or at least serious injury to one or both of the contenders. If you look at this picture, uh, you can clearly see how the one at the bottom has got his nails into the into the flanks of uh, of the the one on top, and uh, in his left paw, uh, the right hand uh, claw, you can see here uh, sticking out. Um, we basically got to this other guy, and you can see the the excruciating pain in the in the eyes of uh, of the one lion. It's usually, uh, you know, these takeovers uh, usually only succeed when the existing dominant male is getting old and weak. It can also happen that two coalition males will take uh, on the existing dominant male. And of course, in two uh, coalition males, it's much easier for them to, uh, to then take over, to take over a pride. Dominant males, like I said earlier, will only be allowed to stay on in the pride for a maximum of three years. Uh, the, the, the females in a pride will never allow them to breed with their own daughters. The expelling is done by, by all the females in the pride. So by three years, uh, your time is up, buddy, and you're welcome to go and uh, they then kick, uh, kick him out, he will then become a roaming nomad uh, looking for another pride to take over. So when they're younger, it's much easier for them to challenge another dominant male. And um, of course, you know, as they get older, it becomes uh, much more difficult and you will often find the older males to be um, single nomads. Kalahari lions are territorial and they won't follow the migrating patterns of their prey. All antelope, um, except for blue villabeast in the Kalahari, uh, seasonally migrate in search of better grazing opportunities. And of course, because the lions are territorial, they won't follow these migrating antelope, uh, especially if they, if they track uh, eastwards uh, into Botswana the lions will stay behind in the, in the Kalahari. Uh, they will also patrol their territorial ground boundaries regularly. Uh, their movement is only restricted by the presence of cubs in the pride. Um, territories of the Kalahari lions are up to 15 times bigger uh, than that of lions in Kruger. So uh, a typical Territory of a Kalahari lion is uh, up to one uh, a thousand square kilometers, which is significantly bigger than uh, than the lions in Kruger. If I'm not mistaken, the Kruger lions their territory is about 450 kilometers square kilometers. So uh, let me just start my video. I just want to uh, just want to uh, show you uh, Lofi's dry at the back. Uh, for a few moments, and then I will go back uh, uh, to voice again. Uh, the presence of uh, man-made water holes, of course, uh, in the Nossop and Alp rivers, and even uh, in the dunes, has a big influence on the availability and the preference of prey. Uh, we all know that, uh, you know, I earlier said that the blue villabeers don't migrate. Blue villabeers, by the way, are the only antelope that uh, that need to drink water daily. And they often stay very close to these water holes and uh, they then later become very easy prey for the, uh, for the lions. Uh, my, my lions patrol and mark their territories um, to keep other males away from their prides. And it's quite interesting to see uh, how they go about doing this. Uh, they mark their territories uh, by careful placement of a few olfactory notice boards, if you can put it that way. Uh, male lions uh, use urine and also um, scent glands between their toes uh, to mark their territory. Urine is, uh, is basically used in three ways. 
um, they uh, they will stand on on the sand and they will urinate on the sand and they will then basically uh, stand with their hind feet in the sand and wet their feet uh, with the urine and they will then distribute the scent as far as they walk uh, they will distribute the scent of the urine that they stood in with their with their hind uh, with their hind legs. Another uh, another way uh, of uh, marking is they will lift their tail. Remember the earlier slide we looked at those coalition males, the one lifted each tail. So they will lift their tails, and they will direct the penis backwards. And they will then urinate by repetitive spraying on plants, uh, sp uh, distributing those uh, those scents uh, on the plant matter. A third way uh, is, of course, what they will do is they will urinate on the soil, and then they will vigorously kick the soil and plant matter backwards with their uh, back legs to distribute the, the scent as um, as far as possible. Uh, we we arrived at this scene shortly after the lion basically kicked the soil uh, in different directions, and you can see the the soil is actually uh, still slightly um, slightly wet. And then uh, finally, um, they will also mark. Uh, their territory by pressing very hard with their front paws against uh, tree trunks and tree stumps. Uh, with this, they uh, release um, scent uh, caught up in uh, glands, inter, um, interdigital scent glands between their toes, and they will then mark these, uh, these uh, trunks and um, and tree stumps with, with their front paws. They also use, uh, it's not always, if you, if you see them doing this, it's not always to mark their territory. Uh, they often use the same behavior or display the same behavior uh, to clean and sharpen their nails, of course, um, when, they, when they do that. And also, you know, especially after they, they slept for a while, it's a nice way to stretch out and to uh, to do that against uh, against these these tree trunks. Uh, like we said earlier, male lions is uh, sexually mature from age of about uh, between four and five years of age. They actually they became they, they become sexually mature at uh, plus minus three months already, but. Um, they, uh, they will seldom be sexually active before four to five years of age. And that is then normally when they are ready to take over a pride. Once again, you can have a look at this slide. Uh, this is a male uh, lion of just younger than five years. Uh, you can see there are no fight marks on the body or on the face. So he had an easy ride. Uh, he was not involved in any fights. His trouble will start now. I mean, he is ready to take over a pride and to challenge a dominant male uh, very soon. Um, uh, another interesting thing about male lions uh, of the Kalahari is that they, that they can actually produce useful sperm uh, for, for the full 16 years of their life. So they can... They have the ability to breed from five years old or four years old to, uh, to 16 years old. So they can effectively breed for, for 12 years, uh, the, male, the male lions. Females, on the other hand, they are sexually mature from plus minus 34 months. And most of them would have uh, given birth by the time they are four years of age. Uh, you can see this is a young female. She's uh, about uh, about to be able to breed, and females can breed until they are 15 years old. Uh, although they they do lose a bit of the reproductive abilities from age 11, 
they do have the ability to um, to actually breed until they are 15 years old. Um, I'm going to stop my video now. I think you've uh, had an, uh, a good look at uh, the fire going. I want to start praying uh, while I talk. So I'm going to stop the video and then we can carry on with uh, with the presentation. So uh, our next slide. Um, with the next slide, I would like to talk uh, a little bit about uh, a few breeding facts of uh, Kalahari lion. Uh, in, in the Kalahari, like elsewhere, there are no breeding season. The females can be on heat any time of the year and they can, uh, they can mate all year round. Uh, the females will be on heat on average 55, every 55 days. So roughly speaking, about uh, every, every six weeks, more or less, they will uh, come on heat and then they can, uh, then they can breed. Uh, females excrete uh, sexual hormones, pheromones in the urine to indicate that they are on heat. And you know, these uh, males, when they smell these uh, urine, or often they smell the sexual organs of the, of the, of the lionesses to determine a readiness for breeding. Now, this guy is definitely not smiling at my camera. They will display the smiling expression by lifting their upper lip uh, and exposing their teeth shortly after they have smelt uh, the urine. And this action is known as... Uh, as uh, the Fleming response. So what they actually do is they suck air in through their front teeth and they've got a small organ in, um, situated on the roof of their mouth called the Jacobson's organ. And the air uh, filled with these pheromones of the female urine will then flow over this Jacobson's organ. And the male will then use this organ to decode the pheromones left behind in the urine to establish whether the female is ready to breed, uh, to breed or not. So um, no smiling, uh, he's busy with the Fleming response, this guy. Uh, and then the, the sexual behavior um, during breeding is actually also very interesting to observe that. Um, this is the case where the, the king of the jungle actually initially became very submissive. Uh, these females can be very entertaining. They will walk in front of the male and they will clap him a few times through the, through the face with their tails. Uh, they, um, they are, it's quite uh, comical to see that and to, uh, to see the lion male actually allows her to, uh, to play, uh, to play with him. Breeding always takes place in isolation. So once the female is ready to breed, they will, the male and female will, will leave the pride and they will find a, a place where they can actually breed, uh, in privacy. The females will always uh, initiate the breeding process and she, like I said, she will lift the tail, she will sweep, sweep it through the face of the male. And then of course, um, they will rub against each other and there's uh, nogal a reelike gefreier, as you say. And when she's ready to take him, she will then squat in front of him and he will then, uh, he will then mount her from, uh, from behind. The breeding process is a fervent and passionate uh, affair. It normally lasts for about 25 seconds, as my were, and it goes with a lot of growling and neck biting and roaring. And you know, you can't actually, if you um, if you observe it, you can't uh, think that it is uh, pleasant for these two at all. The male will dismount uh, after about 25 seconds, and he will. Um, then uh, on, on dismounting her, you will often get a few slaps through the face uh, and the female will then roll over and lie on her back for about 20 minutes. 
before the next session uh, commences. Uh, breeding time in the Kalahari depends on the on the length of time the female is on heat. It can actually last longer, but in the Kalahari, lions breed normally between two and four days at a time. And, uh, you know, you can do your sums uh, if, uh, if it happens every 20 minutes. Over four days, uh, more than 100 copulations can take place during, uh, during this time. Uh, the gestation period for lions is uh, 110 days. And the average litter size for lions in the Kalari is between two and four young, uh, young cubs. So when the female is ready to give birth, she will leave the pride and she will look for a suitable place to give birth. Um, they, they definitely favor uh, the undergrowth uh, of low growing branches of shepherd's trees against, um, against the dunes. So they will find a, a nice spot to stash their young um, and to hide them from other predators and uh, and birth will take about 30 minutes. The, Nile, uh, the lioness will, as the young ones um, emerge, she will basically uh, lick them clean and uh, and then, you know, these, uh, these young lioness, uh, these young cubs are all born with their eyes closed. Uh, they are helpless for a few days after birth and that they will immediately start uh, sucking on their on the mother. They are dependent on their mother's milk for three months, and after three months, she will wean them. Uh, the mother, of course, will regularly leave them, uh, stashed under these trees, uh, because she need to hunt, of course, to maintain her milk production. And she may uh, leave these cups unattended for for quite a number of days if food is scarce. She will not return to them until she has uh, until she has eaten. Uh, uh, her instinct is to produce milk and not to care for uh, for the young because she of course realizes if she if she don't eat she she won't be able to feed them. She will also frequently move the young ones from hiding place to hiding place because if they stay underneath one uh, shepherd's tree or one um, other tree for for too long their scent will get uh, well established in that area and that may of course um, lure uh, other predators to to their den so she will move them regularly from uh, from tree to tree and from uh, dune to dune to uh, to prevent uh, other predators to, um, to get to them. After about six weeks, uh, the young ones and mother will join the pride uh, and the cubs will accompany the pride on hunts when they turn about three months old. Remember I said they, they start, the mother will start weaning them at three months and um, and as soon as they are three months old, they will start accompanying the pride on hunts, and they will start to eat. Um, they will start to eat small portions of meat um, at that age. They won't participate in the hunt uh, until they are about two years old. Uh, only then will the pride allow them to uh, to start to participate in the hunt itself. Another very interesting feature of, um, of Kalahari lions uh, that you don't get in, uh, in, uh, in other parks is the, the high um, incidence of cup mortality. Um, cup mortality amongst Kalahari lions are the highest of any region in Africa. Only three out of 10 cups will reach the age of one year uh, in Kruger, by, uh, by the way, it's, uh, the average is about f 5 out of 10. Uh, and then also, depending on food availability and other conditions, 
only one out of 10 cubs may reach the age of 18 months. So um, I think you will agree that is uh, that significant uh, figures and very high uh, cup mortality that we that we experience in in the Kalahari. There are of course uh, a few reasons for this uh, high cup mortality, <coughs> and the five main reasons. <coughs> pardon me. The five main reasons are basically, first of all, I already touched on, on this, and that is hunger. They die of hunger. <clears throat> the lionesses uh, can leave the cubs on their own for up to five days at a time in search of food. And, uh, of course, you know, you can, you can imagine there's no ways in which uh, young cubs will survive uh, for five days without their mother's milk. So they will simply starve. Uh, another, another reason is, of course, infanticide. Um, and this picture shows us uh, what I mean. <clears throat> uh, infanticide, you get where males kill the existing cubs in a pride, when they take over the pride. Now, this is a very interesting behavior. Um, in Elsewhere, even in Kruger and especially in the north, you will find <clears throat> that lion males, when they take over a pride, will tolerate uh, the young cubs of, uh, of another male. And uh, even though they are still very young, they will <clears throat> actually allow the cubs to, uh, to survive. In the Canary, however, <clears throat> these males, they realize while they are young ones and while they still drink uh, on their mother, there's no chance for him to breed because the, the females will only get uh, come uh, on, in heat um, a couple of weeks after she has stopped uh, producing milk. So while she is feeding her cubs, he cannot uh, sow his seeds and start to uh, build his own, uh, his own uh, uh, young ones. And he will, almost without exception, he will start killing those young cubs um, to, make, uh, to get the, the female to stop producing milk and to start breeding with her. Then another, another reason, uh, cubs are often left on, on their own while their mother is out hunting, and they often fell prey to other predators, especially leopard and spotted hyena. They are always on the, on the prowl for, for, young lion, uh, for young lion cubs. And depending on the time of the year, uh, the females often uh, just don't produce enough milk to sustain the cubs. When prey is scarce or the available meat at a kill uh, is so little that, uh, that it can't sustain her milk production, uh, then, uh, you know, she will, she will remain with the cups and the, the cups will suckle, but uh, there will just be not enough milk for them to survive. And, um, and then lastly and finally, uh, disease and parasites can kill these young ones. Um, Ricketts disease is a, is a common disease in cups. It is basically a, a vitamin D deficiency, <clears throat> which attacks the bones and it softens the bones of these animals. It's terrible to see these cups um, with Ricketts and, uh, and it can be fatal to the young, uh, young cups. Um, Kalahari lions, of course, are opportunistic hunters. Like I said earlier, they would like to eat as much as they can without working too hard for it. Uh, I know a few, um, I know a few uh, human colleagues that are, uh, that are likely inclined. But uh, <clears throat> they, uh, like I said earlier, they do not follow the migratory patterns of their prey. And that often leaves them with little or no uh, choice to what to eat during the dry season. Uh, another interesting observation, if you look at this slide, is the way in which this lion attacks this beast. 
Um, and I'll talk about the hunting techniques later, but, uh, but uh, look at how he basically jumps on his back. Uh, and this is quite unique amongst, um, amongst the Kalahari lions. And I will explain that to you uh, a little bit um, later. Lions um, in the river beds have more success in killing prey uh, because the, the surface of the soil is much harder. Uh, even though there is less, uh, there is less vegetation, uh, and the kill success rate of of dune lions is uh, is a mere forty five percent, so it's much harder for them to to hunt in the to hunt in the dunes. Also, if you look at the speed of um, the typical prey of a lion, we can here see the maximum speed of a lion is uh, eighty kilometers an hour. And it will obviously opt for slower, uh, slower running prey. Hence the reason why Gemsbok is by far the, the most uh, favorite large prey uh, for, for lions. I mean, it's almost 60 or 20 kilometers an hour slower than, uh, than lions. And obviously Springbok being uh, much faster uh, lions normally only catch um, young um, young lambs, and even shortly after they uh, shortly after they uh, were born. Um, during certain times of the year, when larger prey is scarce, Kalahari lion will hunt small prey. As a matter of fact, the ratio of small prey in their diet is, uh, the, is, is once again the highest of all lion in Africa. Um, small prey, uh, and by small prey I mean, let's say, anything smaller than, um, than an adult springbuck. Uh, will form uh, roughly about um, I would say 50% of their uh, of their diet in some cases and uh, depending on the time of the year uh, small prey like porcupines and we will come to that just now will form about 30% um, of a lion's diet in the in the dunes uh, well uh, uh, Prof. Fritz Elof um, Prof. Fritz Elof, uh, basically indicated that um, that uh, they can kill up to uh, they can eat up to 29 percent of uh, of porcupines in their in their diet uh, another significant difference between lions in the Kalahari because they hunt small prey is they have to kill more often uh, so, uh, Kalahari lion on average, uh, they, they make about 50 kills uh, per annum uh, versus in Kruger, the average kill rate is uh, 15, one five per annum. So, 50, five, zero uh, versus, uh, versus 15. Uh, lions are nocturnal animals. They will walk on average 12 kilometers a night in search of prey. Uh, and females can even walk uh, slightly further um, in search of food. The biggest distance covered by a lioness uh, with a collar measured um, was 42 kilometers in one night. Uh, and that uh, I think you will agree that's quite, uh, quite significant. The, the presence of cubs uh, does not uh, influence the distance uh, um, which they cover on hunts. They will simply leave the cubs behind, do the killing, and then they will fetch the, the, the cubs afterwards to, to join them at, uh, at the feast. Like I said earlier, <coughs> research by, uh, done by Prof. Fritz Elof in the 80s indicated that porcupines form about 29% of a dune lion's diet. And not only are they readily available, uh, a dune lion's success rate of killing porcupines is 85%. So it's quite high. There is, of course, a downside um, in hunting porcupines. And in the next slide, you can see 
uh, porcupine, you know, je vat nie sommer een eestervark, jy is nie sommer net vat, vat nie, soos hulle sê in die kap. These, um, these lions often get, uh, get injured by the quills of, uh, of, these, uh, of these porcupines. Um, I already said that, uh, that I prefer to hunt gemsbok. The average daily mate uh, meat intake of a, of a female lion is about 4.7 kilograms in the Kalahari. And that of males is about 7.2 kilograms. Uh, they, by the way, they can eat about 30 kilograms of meat uh, in one city. So that's, uh, that's quite uh, significant. Uh, amount of uh, amount of meat. Gemsbok uh, form a big portion of their diet. Um, about 31 percent of uh, of the Kalahari lions. Uh, 31 percent of uh, of the Kalahari lions diet consists of uh, gemsbok, and they uh, they on average prefer to kill uh, gemsbok males than than females. Um, and once again, you can observe the hunting technique here, and maybe it's, uh, the time is opportune for me to speak about that now. Uh, what is interesting about these, uh, these males is they, um, of these hunting techniques, these lions tend to jump on the back of, of their prey, and then they bite the spine of the prey to break the spine of the prey. Now, elsewhere, Lions will normally attack the prey from the front. They will go for the neck or the, the nozzle uh, the, the nozzle to suffocate these animals. But in the Kalahari, without exception, they jump on the back and you will see they will try their utmost to, to break, the, to break the, the back of these, uh, these animals. Um, <clears throat> Kalahari lions will often kill other predators, uh, but they will very seldom eat them. Uh, they are known to break open ostrich egg to, eggs to get to the, the content. And just a few, um, a few notes on the communication of, of, uh, of them. Uh, of all the big uh, roaring cats, a lion's roar is by far the loudest. It can reach 115 decibels um, if measured within a meter of the lion. And that is equal to the sound of an ambulance siren if you measure it one meter away from the, from the siren itself. Uh, lions are able to communicate with each other over distances of uh, up to 18 kilometers. We as humans will hear them up to eight kilometers, but, but uh, because of their superior um, hearing, they will be able to, to of course, uh, communicate with each other up to... 18 kilometers. I know that uh, I'm over the time, but uh, I'm gonna just gonna share one or two more slides with you. Uh, lions sleep um, or rest for up to 18 hours a day. They are extremely lazy. Uh, they will also remain with big carcasses for up to two days after a kill. You will never see a lion in the Kalahari walk on a full stomach. They will eat and sleep and eat and sleep and they will only start moving when they are hungry again. Uh, another, um, uh, another interesting features about Kalahari lions, um, like elsewhere, they are uh, big enemies with hyenas because uh, they hunt the same prey, more or less, and uh, secondly, they both hunt at night. They're nocturnal hunters. And in the Kalahari, these hyenas are, um, are very good hunters. They are not scavengers, they are primarily hunters. And they, uh, they are, of course, uh, big enemies with, uh, with lions, and they're always in, in each, other's, uh, each other's face. Uh, before I wrap up, I just want to share with you um, Otto and Maya Birkes. They have done recent research, lion research in, um, in the Kalahari, and the research results was uh, quite significant. Um, they, 
when I say significant, they, there are significant changes in the demographics of, first of all, um, a shift in, in, in uh, preferred diet of, of these lions. Um, like uh, Prof. Fritz Elof earlier indicated that uh, Kalari lions prefer or go for small mammals mostly, uh, these two husband and wife team found that the Kalahari lions prefer larger prey. Uh, they went, um, they, their most favorite prey was Thamesbok, but they will catch more larger prey than, than, than smaller prey. This may of course be a, a temporary shift um, as larger prey became more abundant over the past couple of years and it may, it may shift back, um, back again. Uh, more alarming, however, uh, is their findings on the demographics and shift in the ratio between male and female births. Uh, their findings indicated a, a significant increase in the birth rate of male cubs in the Kalari. And you can imagine, you know, if um, by, uh, at the moment uh, the ratio is uh, more than 50% uh, male cubs are, are born and female cubs, and this phenomenon poses a serious threat to the sustainable livelihood of uh, the ecology of lions in, in the Kalahari. So I would like to, uh, to wrap up uh, what makes Kalahari lions different to other lions. Uh, and maybe I can, I can start showing you a uh, his eye again. The, um, the first difference is the, uh, the extraordinary sexual abilities. We've dealt with that. Secondly, the long reproductive life is uh, slightly different. And then the stamina to hunt over, uh, to over large differences. Uh, they display a unique hunting technique. Uh, also, their dependence on small mammals as prey is unique. Uh, we see that it's the highest in Africa. A very high cup mortality. Uh, they form smaller prides than elsewhere. And then, of course, they extraordinarily large uh, territories. So, uh, hopefully, I managed to show you that although Kalari lions are of the same subspecies, uh, they are certainly very different uh, to lions elsewhere. And unless you go and observe them in the Kalari itself, there's nothing more beautiful than a Kalari black uh, main male walking over a dune very graciously in search of, uh, in search of uh, food. I would like to end off by um, acknowledge, uh, acknowledging my mentors in the Kalari. And I would like to, uh, to acknowledge um, uh, uh, um Stoffel and um Elias Larish, who I have learned a lot from. I've spent as a child many hours in the dunes with them. I would also like to uh, acknowledge um, Gus Moles, uh, the work that he has done amongst the lions, uh, Prof. Fritz Elof, uh, who is known to have done a lot of research on lions, especially Lofi's Dry. By the way, Lofi's Dry was named after him. His nickname amongst friends was Lofi Yelof. So uh, that uh, he used Lofi's Dry as his base camp. And then also, um, I would like to acknowledge Carl Kleinman on the left uh, bottom right of your screen, otherwise known as Fed Pit. Fed Pit, uh, I have spent many hours with him in the dunes and there is no greater guide and the, uh, the felt knowledge that uh, Fed Pit um, has got on the Kalahari, there's no, it's like nobody else. And then finally in the middle, Nardis Duplessis standing with my youngest daughter, uh, Nardis, uh, who was very closely uh, worked with the lions in the Kalahari and I've also learned a lot from him. Uh, finally, I would like to acknowledge um, people that allowed me to make use of their the photographs. They um, 
supplemented my own photographs and I would like to acknowledge Hannes Lochner, uh, Roxanne Reed, uh, Wilkinson's World, Leon Fouchier, Graham Dyer, uh, Willy van Skalpwijk and, and Johannes van Niekerk. And with that, uh, like they say in Afrikaans, flake, flake, my serious eight. I'm sorry I kept you busy for so long, but uh, thank you very much, uh, Francois. Thank you so much, Willy. Yes, it was so interesting. And the questions that we've had tonight, uh, we probably going to have to filter a little bit through. I think it's just over 400. Uh, I don't know whether you're ready to handle them all. Uh, just joking. I'm uh, also not volunteering to take the, uh, the, the and measure the decibels from the line a meter away. Um, I'll leave that to you guys that are more experienced. Um, Vili, some of the questions that came through tonight, we're obviously not going to be able to handle them all, but I would like to forward some of these on to you. Um, let's start off with Rod Bell. Has TB been found in Kalahari lions? This has been asked a number of times. Okay. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, fortunately, um, uh, TB has not been found in Kalahari lions like the lions in Kruger. So the short answer is no. And we're very fortunate. Thank you for that. And then a uh, question from Heidi Snaiman. Thank you for sharing your rich knowledge, Willy. Do you know if lions in RSA have a diverse enough gene pool if they are originally located from two parks? Have the scientists observed genetic dispositions making them vulnerable to certain diseases or defects? I think it's a, I think it's an interesting question. Uh, one must remember, although they they mainly come from two gene pools, there may be uh, more gene pools. There are certainly more than enough, uh, uh, more than enough prides and individuals. Uh, so, although, like I said, in the uh, in the Gemsbok Park on its own, although there are uh, it's one gene pool, there are ten ten known prides. And uh, there are certainly more uh, in the in the Transfrontier Park. There may be, if you look at the, if you if you just take the figures and, and carry it over, there may be about twenty five uh, prides. So um, so the gene pool is quite diverse, uh, and I think Kruger's gene pool is even bigger than uh, than the Kalahari because Kruger is obviously much bigger than than Kalahari. So I would think it's uh, safe to say it's big enough. Thank you for that. Then a question from Mohammed: Do lions have specific physical characteristics that help them cope with the extreme caloric temperatures in winter and in summer? Yes, it's a it's a it's a good question, and hopefully I have dealt with some of that um, during my presentation. Um, uh, they, <clears throat> of course, uh, rivers are, are much cooler in winter than in summer. Uh, than the dunes, so you will off, you will very often find that that uh, the the lions will move towards the dunes in winter uh, because it's much warmer uh, much warmer in the dunes. Of course, all animals in the Kalahari um, are uh, are are very inactive in the in the warmth of day. Uh, you will always find lions sleeping underneath a tree. And you know, there's plenty of shade. Uh, these uh, big uh, camel thorn trees provide plenty of shade. So they will sleep in summer. Uh, they will stay in the cool. They only hunt at night. Uh, often you will find them, uh, like I said, you know, water is readily available, although lions get more than enough moisture from the blood of their prey. And I think that's basically, that's basically, they are well adapted for, for those harsh conditions. Thank you, Willy. And then from Jenny the Jager, do two different prides spend time together or do they steer clear of each other? Prides will, no, will never spend time together. But what, what often happen is uh, Dominant males will allow other prides to travel through his territory in search of food. So, um, you know, when these other males, uh, if, if they're not a threat to take over the pride, 
they will tolerate them to sort of share territory for a, for a short period of time. But they will never permanently uh, be in close proximity to each other. Thank you for that. And then a question from Facebook from Sivashni. Have there been document cases of lions expelled from a pride, eventually taking control of the very same pride and their birth and breeding? Oh, that's a, that's a interesting one. No, I'm not aware. I'm not aware of that. But um, I can certainly, uh, you know, if I can ask the lean to, to keep your details, I can certainly find out uh, people that will definitely know um, is, uh, is people uh, like Gus Moles, and I can find out from Gus if he is aware of, of any of that. I'm not aware of any uh, second takeovers. Thank you. And uh, yes, we've, we've got the, the, the names on, uh, on the questions and answers, and we can obviously follow up afterwards on email and or on Facebook of the questions that we've been able to answer tonight. A question from James Briett. Is it true that the mane of the Kalari lion, the male lion, is darker than that of the Kruger lions? Um, I, I, I would say, uh, based on my own observations, that yes, it is uh, slightly darker. And of course, the mane gets darker the older the lion gets. Uh, I mean, uh, I think most of you will agree that... Um, if uh, those of you that get to the Kalari often, uh, and I base this on pure my own observations, that I think the, the main is definitely slightly darker. Oh. And then another Kruger. interesting one that came through from Facebook side, Elise, do lionesses also have the same glands between the toes? It's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, uh, they, may, they may have those same glands, but they never use it. So lionesses uh, very seldom uh, mark territory, although they do patrol their territorial area with males quite often. They are known to to patrol it, and they will they will year and there leave uh, scent marks with urine, but those scent marks are often uh, uh, related to uh, to breeding and not necessarily uh, territorial territorial markings. But yes, they do urinate, and they may uh, have the same uh, scent glands, interdigital scent glands, but I've never seen a uh, marking a tree with that. Mm -hmm. Looks like we've got time for about two more questions. I'm going to com combine this last two. Mark Flint, is the smell of the urine unique and easily distinguishable by humans? And then Colin Bloom says, for how long does a urine scent last, if you could combine those two? Oh, um, I, I, have never, I have never smelled urine and I've got no, uh, I've got no intent to, uh, to get <laughs> up to smell, uh, to smell urine. Um, uh, no, I, uh, well, all I know for a fact is one thing you know, uh, lion dung is, uh, it's got a terrible, terrible smell and that of course uh, is easily picked up by humans uh, although I have been in close uh, proximity to, uh, to lion urine I have never really smelled it from a distance um, the, 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 the smell of lions are of course uh, much superior than that of humans it's very difficult for me to say how long the scent will last but if you if you look at, um, at how often they mark their territories, then I would take a, a decent guess and say uh, that he will have to leave his note every about, I would say, every 10 days or so. But that's, a, that's purely a guesstimate. Um, I, uh, and, and that's certainly not based on fact. And then uh, just before the last question, Anonymous attendee asked if a lioness dies when she has cubs, will a female in the pride adopt the cubs? No, I have never seen, I have never seen that. It may happen elsewhere, but uh, not in the Kalari. 
Lily, and then uh, our last question for tonight comes from Brene Jonker. She says, just want to know from Billy, the lions at Lofis, do they only drink Kalahari water or do they prefer something stronger? And with that one, I'm going to end up on our questions for tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Francois. Um, you know, that uh, that depends on whether she means this lion sitting here or the real reliance. You know, I was very tempted to start my presentation. Our esteemed uh, chairperson, uh, Paul um, called that started his first webinar by welcoming everybody with a glass of a uh, cup of coffee in his hands. Uh, tonight, as you can see, it's uh, very cold here at Lofi's Tarai. And uh, we will, we, uh, you know, unfortunately, a cup of coffee wouldn't, uh, wouldn't uh, warm me up enough uh, for this presentation. Uh, but, uh, but no, you know, uh, we, can, we can have a long chat about the quality of water in the, in, in, in the Kalahari. It's amazing, your Lofi's dry water is so salty that, um, I mean, when we camp there, you actually have to wash your glasses in separate uh, fresh water. Otherwise, it's uh, packed with, uh, with these salts. And yet uh, the lions, uh, the lions drink uh, drink water at these uh, these salty salty things. So it seems to me that generally speaking, lions uh, don't mind uh, the the mineral content uh, in water in the Kalahari. They, st they show no preference for 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 water quality. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Vili. Once again, and uh, I would like to ask you somewhere in the future if we could uh, ask you to come back and uh, share some more of your, your Galagari ecology with us. Um, it sounds like we can also talk about water and uh, that could also take us some time. We will answer some of the questions that we haven't answered tonight, um, either on Facebook and or on email, for those of you that we've got the email addresses of. And then thank you for all our viewers, our friends and family that joined us tonight and enjoy, be safe and we'll see you around again. Good night. Thank you very much.